You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Robin Hansen, returning to the podcast. Robin, thanks for returning to Economics Detective Radio. Great to be back. So our topic for today is your second book. It's called The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life, and it's co-authored with Kevin Simler. So Robin, why don't you start by describing uh, exactly what The Elephant in the Brain is? It seems it's a reference to, of course, the elephant in the room. So how, how does that metaphor translate? Right. So The Elephant in the Room is the thing in the room that we all kind of know is there but don't want to talk about. And the elephant in the brain is the thing that's in our brain that most of us don't want to talk about. And it's our hidden selfish motives. So uh, we humans evolved to have social norms, i.e. rules about what we're supposed to do or not supposed to do, and uh, we punish each other if we violate the norms. And a lot of these norms are expressed in terms of motives. Uh, that if I hit you accidentally, that's okay. If I hit you on purpose, that's not okay. And as a result, we uh, manage our beliefs about our motives to tell ourselves uh, that we're, we have good motives. So we are constantly looking at what we're doing and trying to find a way to explain what we're doing in terms of good motives. Motives that people would approve of and motives that don't violate norms. And it turns out that this means we are actually pretty ignorant about the real motives for a lot of our behavior. Uh, now, this might seem that it would be true sometimes, but our book is saying it's true a lot, a lot more than you might think. You are just ignorant of your motives all over your life. Right. Well, it, it would seem that that purpose could be served by knowing your true motives and just being really good at lying about them. So wh- why do you think we self-deceive? Well, uh, when you think one thing and say another, uh, a lot of clues leak out. (laughs) We're not very good at lying. And so, you know, other people can look at our tone of voice, our body language, whether we're sweating, whether we seem to be shaking. uh, And they use that a lot to figure out if if we're lying on purpose. But when we just believe something sincerely, um, none of those clues let on that our subconscious believes otherwise, because uh, that's far away from those things. Right. And and so this is sort of contrasting to maybe a a blank slate view of the mind, uh, you know, something that uh, a philosopher from the 18th or 19th century might have believed about humanity, that we have these perfect reasoning minds and we just use them to observe the world in an unbiased way. Right. Although by now, many of your... (laughs) Our listeners will have have heard many discussions of how humans are misled by themselves and self-deceived and and often don't know themselves for very well. So that's not very original of us. But what we noticed is that when other people talk about self-deception and people not knowing their motives very well, they almost never connect it to our larger social institutions. They never, they really talk about how that changes how we should think about education or medicine or politics or religion or art. When we get to those subjects, most people talk about the policy of those subjects they tend to just assume that the usual motives we would say are the relevant motives and they go on from there. Hmm. So you have um, chapters on many different things. The first part of your book is about why we hide our motives. And you, in particular, you go through some, uh, some examples from animals, which is, of course, relevant because we all evolved through a similar process and some of these animals are you know other primates our nearest uh, relatives so how does animal behavior relate to your thesis well there are some animal behaviors that we know about that if humans were looking at them and talking about them we would have some obvious explanations of them it's the sort of explanations we would give if we were doing those things and it's interesting to notice that the actual explanations for those animals are quite different now those animals don't deal with social norms and therefore they don't need to tell themselves a story about why they've been doing things and so we don't know that they're actually wrong to themselves about why they do things but we can see that when humans look at what they do we tend to misjudge. So, for example, uh, most primates spend time grooming each other. That is, they pick at each other's fur to take out things like bugs. And this looks like helping behavior. Now, that's the way humans would describe it to each other and, and how we would explain ourselves if somebody asked what we were doing. It looks like helping. Uh, you know, it's bad to have things in your fur and nice to have other people take them out. But when we study this behavior in a little more detail, we notice that the amount of time primates spend grooming each other 
doesn't really have that much due to the relation to the need for grooming. That is when places are dirty or there's more bugs or they have bigger bodies that take longer to pick at, they don't actually groom more often. However, they do groom more often and a lot more often when their groups are larger. And the standard explanation for this is that grooming is more of a political allegiance building and, and practice. You basically groom your friends periodically and then they groom you and this is the way that you are reassuring each other that you are still friends. It's a lot like today at the office uh, when you come in in the morning you might wander around other people's office and say you know how was that show last night or what about that game <laughs> as a way to uh, make sure that you know they know and you know that uh, you're still on good terms. Right. There, there's a, a term linguists have, uh, phatic. Uh, you have a, a phatic conversation or phatic speech. And uh, it might seem, you know, strange from the way we think of our own speech and our, our behaviors that a lot of the talking we do has no informational purpose. You know, when, when you talk, you know, when you say, how about that weather? Or, hey, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? It, it doesn't really... Uh, convey much or any information, but you know, linguists know that it serves a social purpose, and so th that would be similar, akin to this grooming behavior in other primates. Right. So just to be clear, uh, almost every area of human life has many relevant motives. Um, and when we say the usual story, we're talking about the, the usual motive you would explain yourself as doing there that most people would typically in the most public situations where, where you are the most visible. Uh, and so in conversation, uh, that's often information sharing is, is the motive that we would most be willing to give. And the alternative motive that we might highlight is also only one of many motives. It's just a motive that's more important than we tend to give it credit for. It's even more important than the usual motive, we would say. So it's not that we're denying the usual motives that isn't relevant sometimes. Uh, it's an excuse. So as usual, when you're doing uh, A and you, you make excuse B, the reason why B can be a plausible excuse is that sometimes B is actually what's going on. It wouldn't work to have as an excuse something that never happens. My dog ate my homework only works if sometimes dogs do eat homework. Right? <laughs> so. Right. So I, I'm interesting, interested in, of course, uh, you know, we, uh, we talked on this show about your last book, which was uh, about futurism. But of course, your background is in economics, and you approached that, uh, the, the Age of M, your previous book, um, which we'll, we'll link to our conversation on the show notes page. You approach that from a very economic standpoint, sort of analyzing the economics of it. This book seems like something that would come out of psychology research. And in fact, a lot of the the central sort of tenets of neoclassical economics would seem to assume away hidden motives or, or at, at least appear to make that assumption. So how do you relate this to your field? Well, um, first, uh, I'll say that I think my previous book uh, drew on a lot of different fields. Uh, economics was just one field. I would say my previous book, The Age of M, more you know required me to draw on uh, as wide a range of areas as you need to to describe an entire civilization. So I, I had to talk about computer science, and I had to talk about uh, engineering and cooling systems and things like that. Uh, whereas this book, this was actually driven more by economics <laughs> in the sense that uh, it's trying to explain economic puzzles. So the first area where hidden motives was called to my attention was in medicine, where as a health policy postdoc at UC Berkeley, I had uh, started getting into the details of medicine. I, I had previously been a theorist at Caltech and doing mostly mathematical models. And then getting into the detail of medicine, it seemed to me that our usual story about uh, motives uh, didn't fit very well with most of the details there. Uh, now, just to be clear, I think most of the time when economists explain a behavior, they posit some structure of, of preferences and beliefs and constraints and information, and they produce a story of the behavior in terms of those things. But economists don't actually very often talk about how conscious people are of following those things. Uh, sometimes, you know, it could be that you consciously have a, a purpose in mind and you are pursuing that purpose consciously, and that's explaining the behavior but at other times you aren't very aware consciously of how it works. Nevertheless, the same theory can still apply. And again, economists do not actually take much trouble usually to distinguish how conscious they are positing the behavior. And so 
I actually think, um, you know, talking about hidden motives isn't really contrary to most economic models because most economic models don't take a position on whether the actions are being done consciously. Right. A big part of what you've done on your blog is popularize the signaling theory, which I think really require a lot of its applications require people to have unconscious motives because, uh, you know, a lot of economists would say a lot of higher education, education in general, is done for these signaling reasons. And, of course, if, you know, most people who are not aware of the signaling theory would not say or, or wouldn't believe that they are getting an education for signaling reasons, most people would say and consciously believe that they're getting an education for learning reasons... Well, I think, I mean, if you're literally asking most students, why are you going to school? They'll probably say it will help with my career. <laughs> that would be the most straightforward thing you say. And if you push on them and say, well, how will this help with your career? Then they might start to talk about how they're learning useful material. But that's the next step. And they'll be less confident of that. They're, they're more confident of the fact they're going to school to help with their career. And if you t look at most education researchers in schools of education or even in economics um, and ask, well, how does going to school help your career, then they will start to talk about learning the material. And of course, you also hear learning the material is the explanation if you write a you know, letter of application to a school or you hear a graduation ceremony or you hear a politician talking about it. Um, the learning the material is the explanation that you know is the most public, the one we're most willing to give in public. But in private, a lot of students are happy. Say, you know, if, if a professor cancels class, if the student really had the motivation to learn the material, they might think, well, I'm paying tuition. You're not canceling my tuition. How come you're canceling class? Aren't I being cheated here? Uh, I don't get to learn as much material. Uh, but students don't react that way. They are usually quite happy to have class canceled uh, because they expect to get the same credential and to do less work. Uh, and so from their point of view of, of trying to get the credential that gets the career, they seem to be happy. Right. So the, the other th thing I've heard pointed to is that if it was really about the learning, you could just audit all your courses and skip the tuition and the credential, get the same learning, and presumably get the same outcome. Well, in fact, that's what I did for a number of years. <laughs> Personally, I was living near Stanford University, and I realized I could just go sit in on classes at Stanford without registering or applying getting permission in any way, and that works fine. As long as you don't want a credential, uh, you can get the very best college educations by just walking over and sitting down and participating. Right. But of course, somebody take, takes that as advice, by the way, that that's not, not advice. You... You shouldn't. There's a serious downside to that, which is at the end of four years, you know, you go to an employer and say, I have Stanford education. I have four years of, of sitting in lectures and learning. And, um, you know, your your resume goes in the reject pile because you don't have the degree. And that is that is what uh, that is their Right. But that's, that's a puzzle, though, from the point of view of the usual story, that the point of school is to learn the material. You might think, well, you know, they don't know that you've learned the material yet, but maybe with a little trial internship, you could show them you'd learn the material, and then that would be good enough. So um, the, the general pattern in our whole book is that in each area, we talk about the usual story of our, what the usual motive is, and we identify a number of puzzles that are hard to explain in those terms. And we also offer an alternative motive that we say explains these puzzles better than the usual motive. And so we've just been talking about some puzzles about school here. Why is it the employers don't want you if you haven't officially gotten the credential? In general, when people uh, go to school in high school or college, they do get paid more for completing more years of school, but they get paid three times as much for completing the last year of high school and the last year of college as they do for the other years. But, you know, we know that we don't learn much more in the last year of high school and college. So why are employers paying so much more for that last year? Right. The, it's known as the, the sheepskin effect. Right. And a plausible explanation is that what we are trying to do is show that we are smart and conscientious and conformist. And it, when we show those things, we make ourselves seem promising employees to uh, people who might hire us, uh, even if we haven't learned very much, even if they expect they're basically going to have to teach us everything from scratch. So this, this all fits really well with the, the signaling story. In your section on why we hide our motives, you discuss three important competitive games that humans were uh 
you know, we're exposed to in our ancestral environment that might be evolutionarily important. Uh, those are sex, social status, and politics. So how does the elephant in the brain help us succeed in sex, social status, and politics? Well, um, chimpanzees, uh, who are closely related primates, are very intelligent and they are very social. So uh, they have complicated social worlds and most of what matters to them is managing those complicated social politics. They form alliances and groups and then they have to figure out who's in their group and who's betraying their group and they have to figure out who's in other groups and they have to think about who, who's like who, etc. And uh, that's the world of a chimpanzee. So they have similar sorts of things. They compete for status, they compete for uh, mating, but humans have those same sorts of competitions, but we develop social norms. And because we had language and weapons, then if we had a rule that you're not supposed to hit somebody on purpose, then if somebody saw you hit somebody, then they could use language to tell other people about it, and those other people, if they believed you, could then uh, use weapons to enforce their judgment and punish you for that. And the net result is that you didn't want people to notice you hitting somebody and then to convince other people about it to punish you. Uh, and so we humans need to watch out for norm enforcement. And norm enforcement is, again, largely in terms of our motives. Uh, there's certain motives you're not supposed to have. And so we are eager to look out for what we're doing and, and be able to tell a story at any time of what good motives we had for whatever we did. And that's the reason why we might not be aware of our real motives. Uh, an example we give, others have given too, is, is the idea that the conscious mind, the, the mind that's listening to this and, and might talk back to me if we talk to you, is uh, the press secretary of the brain. It's, it's not the president. It's not the king. So, um, you know, the president or the king might take choices, but then when there's a press conference, it's the press secretary who explains it. And this press secretary doesn't necessarily know exactly what the reasons for things were, but their job is to make up an explanation and make it be plausible so that the press will uh, buy it and report it uh, and make it look good. And so that's your the job of your conscious mind is primarily to keep track of what you're doing and to make sure there's always a good story about what your motives were for doing each thing. And that's why your conscious mind is just unaware of the real reasons for a lot of your behavior, when especially when those reasons might violate norms if they were things you had done on purpose. Right. So if the press secretary, in other words, does, isn't necessarily privy to the the real politique of the government in a, in a real case or the mind in the metaphorical case. The, the press secretary, if the, or if the mind or the organization says that we are doing this thing for totally altruistic and reasonable reasons, you know, we, all, we want what's best for the world and for everyone, and here's why we're doing things, the press secretary doesn't need to know if there's a secret other meaning, and in fact, they would, their job would be compromised if they did. It would be harder for them to do their job if they were aware of the real reasons for behaviors. <laughs> so, so it's it's interesting. Uh, then you're putting a lot of the uh, the weight for you know hu human evolution on language and weapons uh, as as ways to as the reasons why we we do norm formation. Um, actually, a, a friend of mine named Eric Kimbrough, he's at Chapman University now, did did have an experimental test of norm following based on whether people would stop and wait for a stoplight simply because the light was red or it didn't have a walk signal even when there was no reason there's you know no cars no no possible other factor would they just follow the rule because it was the rule and then experimentally connected that to pro-social games like the uh, you know public goods game and, and did show that norm followers tend to be better at cooperating so I think that that uh, that argument seems to be very uh, seems to have been experimentally validated uh, among experimental economists. You have a chapter on cheating and one on self-deception. So this would tie into this press secretary who self or you know is the part of your brain that is deceived by the rest of your brain so that you can cheat. Do you want to say more about that? Yeah, so the, one of the more interesting things is that cheating is easier than you might think it is because the people who are, might enforce norms on you really don't want to, and they're looking for an excuse not to. So an example of that is um, drinking in public. So in many places, there's a law that says you can't drink alcohol in public, and there are people who still want to drink alcohol in public, and uh, the way they manage that is they put the bottle of alcohol in a paper bag, and then they just drink straight out of the paper bag 
So somebody walking by only sees them drinking out of a paper bag and doesn't know what kind of fluid they're drinking. Now, police might see this, and as an actual fact, none of them are fooled. <laughs> The only time almost anybody ever drinks out of a paper bag in public is to hide it as alcohol. So if the police were going to try to arrest people for drinking alcohol in public, then they should be arresting people who are drinking out of paper bags. But they don't because they really don't want to. There is a law against drinking in public. And if, if a police sees you breaking a law, they're supposed to do something about it. But they'd rather not. They, they'd rather go other things. They think of that as a pretty low priority. So if they can see you drinking out of the paper bag, they can say, hey, I didn't know they were drinking alcohol. All I saw was a paper bag. And that gives them an excuse. So that shows you that when we're trying to fool other people in terms of our motives for our behavior, we don't have to fool them very well. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a very coherent story that, that, that hangs together on closer examination. It can be the flimsiest of fig leaf excuses. And still, we can get away with it, at least if other people will let us get away with it. And that's why uh, we hide our motives in, in a relatively flimsy sense often, where most people might know what's really going on, but you give them an excuse not to say so. Mm. So so the rule or enforcing norms, enforcing rules is costly. Most people maybe don't want to do it. Uh, but of course, being seen to, you know, if somebody flagrantly breaks a norm in front of you, you don't want to be seen as someone who just lets that go. And, you know, the, the police, if you have the paper bag, you know, and someone calls them for not on not enforcing the law, then they, they look less ba bad if you have the paper bag. If you don't have the paper bag, then they, they look very, you know, then everybody knows is then common knowledge that they are just ignoring the norm. Uh, another example might be when you, uh, you're speeding and you see a cop in the oncoming lane and you, you know, you hit the brakes. I think they're, there's, there's no way they're fooled by that, seeing you rapidly decelerating towards the speed limit. But, you know, as long as you give the signal that you care enough about, you know, not breaking, not flagrantly breaking the rules in front of them, usually they'll let go. Right. And the same might be true for even education. Uh, if you're writing a statement of purpose about school or giving a graduation ceremony speech, you're supposed to talk about learning the material. In private with your friends, it's fine if you say, I just want to get the degree and get out of there and I don't care anything about this material. Uh, people aren't shocked to hear that in private and it's not like they're going to report it to the police or anything because uh, they just know that there's a different sphere and you're supposed to do a certain thing in public and then people know to do the thing in public and then they don't need to be consistent with that in private. Right. And you have a, a chapter called Counterfeit Reasons, um, where, where you discuss experiments involving split-brain patients. Could, could you go into that? Because it's really interesting. Yeah, the question is, how wrong could you be about your motives? <laughs> uh, so you usually have the impression that you know what you're doing and why, and it's perhaps somewhat shocking. You might think, well, maybe in some stress situation or where you're really emotional or getting divorced or something like that, maybe then you don't know your motives. But surely in most ordinary situations, I know my motives. I, I couldn't be that wrong about it. And there are a set of people called split brain patients where the two halves of their brain have been split entirely. And each half of the brain uh, gets input from one eye and one ear and controls one arm and one leg. And you can separate these. And then you could actually talk to one half of the brain and have it do something in reacting. And then you can ask the other half of the brain to explain what's going on. Now, the truth will be the other half has no idea, but that's not what actually happens. So if you say to one half of the brain, uh, stand up, and then that half will use its one leg to start pushing itself up, and the other half, the other leg will go, will go along with that. And then if you ask the other side of the brain, well, why did you get up? It doesn't know. But apparently what it does very consistently is confidently declares an answer like, I wanted to go get a Coke. Uh, so that's the kind of brain you have, one that is constantly coming up with explanations for its behavior and being very confident in them, even when it has no idea. So, of course, split brain patients are unusual in some ways, but this seems to be the generic default human behavior and capacity, that we are just constantly able to come up with explanations for our behavior. Uh, sometimes they're based on good clues, which means we, we do know why we're doing things, but other times they're based on very little information, but nevertheless, we still come up with those explanations. So this should make you wonder how much you do know about your behavior, because you know your mind is in the habit of 
constantly coming up with very confident explanations even when it doesn't know. Right. So so to so that in the press secretary analogy, the press secretary doesn't necessarily even get a, a briefing about, you know, here's what what we're doing. He's just He's just watching it like everyone else, and then when he gets asked, hey, why, why are you doing that, he confidently makes something up. If necessary, yeah. The press secretary almost never says, I don't know what's going on there. Let me get back to you. Right, and and he has, you know, our brain has a constant stream of, you know, here's why I'm doing this, or or if it doesn't, it can come up with one when when prompted very quickly. Now, everything we've been talking about so far, people could nod and say, yes, in principle, that ought to happen, and it probably happens sometimes. But if I need, to conv- if I, we're going to convince you that this happens a lot, there's really no substitute than going through a lot of specific examples. And that's why two-thirds of the book is going through 10 different areas of life, trying to show you that in each of those areas, your usual story about what you're doing is substantially wrong. Right. So um, one of those is body language. I, I found that quite interesting, Part of what you talk about is how body language conveys differences in status, um, which, of course, I think most of us, you know, we're, we're talking with a friend or a colleague or, you know, maybe, a, you know, a thesis supervisor or something. Apparently, we're doing this status signaling all the time, but uh, I certainly wasn't aware of it. Could you talk about that a little? And nor was I. But apparently, the, the people who are the most aware of it are actors who have to do it. <laughs> So actors, of course, on stage or film uh, use their bodies to communicate a lot to their audiences. And in order to do that believably and persuasively, they have to do the sort of body language that real people would do. And they need to therefore be more consciously aware of how we're actually moving our bodies in order to communicate. And uh, apparently what's going on is that whenever you're talking with somebody else, you are negotiating a relative status. And if the conversation seems to go smoothly, it's because you've agreed on that relative status. Uh, And that's expressed in how open your posture is, which direction your eyes are looking, your steadiness of your tone. If there's a pacing, the higher status person is setting the pace. This would also be true if you're walking together. And these are very consistent. You can see them in movies and, and understand them. And again, actors have to learn to show them in order to be believable on stage. But you and I are usually completely unconscious of this. And that's somewhat remarkable because, as you know, we spend many decades in school learning how to write well and to communicate in words well. And a lot of that is based on conscious theories of of what we're saying and why. And we have this whole other channel of communication, body language, and we we don't spend a minute in, (laughs) in school talking about how to do body language and how to communicate things. Nevertheless, we're really good at it and it's important. So why would we be so unaware of such an important channel of communication? Right. That, it's it's very interesting with the actors. You know, you, I'm trying. I'm thinking of you know sometimes a really high status famous actor is playing a low status role. So you know you, there are scenes where someone gets called into their boss's office and gets dressed down by their boss. Often the character being dressed down is you know the star of the show, the down on his luck protagonist. But he might be a very famous actor. The boss might be someone much less famous, and they would be tempted to be deferential towards this person who in real life is so much more high status, high earnings, you know, more famous than them. So it's, you know, I, I, I'm tempted to go back and, and watch scene, scenes like that and just see, you know, ha- how people, how actors behave now, now thinking about the status differential. Right, but if you if you start to pay attention to that in your actual personal interactions, you'll start to notice which of your associates you are higher status in and which associates you are lower status in. And that will not, then might influence your interactions with them. You might be more conscious of this, and that could cause you problems. Evolution made you unaware of this for a reason, and that's the key point here. Uh, you're unaware of this so that you can blissfully deny that you have any relative status with your friends. You're, you're just all at the same level. But in fact, you're not, um, but you don't want to admit that. Because admitting that would be something of a norm violation. Our distant ancestors were quite egalitarian, and um, they had strong rules about people putting themselves up as higher than other people. You know, bragging and uh, claiming deference and things like that. That's not what you were supposed to do. And even today, we are mostly trying to pretend that we treat each other roughly equally in ordinary social interactions. Right. We we have a, a belief or a conscious belief in egalitarianism, but we may not be very egalitarian totalitarian deep down. Uh, right now, of course, you know, if you ask people, does everybody th- think equally of everyone? Everybody knows in the abstract that that's just completely false. <laughs> 
even so, if you asked when two people were talking, if you asked, well, is do they agree that one person is better than the other? <laughs> and you might say, well, no. You know, they certainly are not acknowledging that one person is better in most pairwise interactions, but they are. I'll be keeping an eye out for that, and I'm sure uh, some of the listeners might be as well. Uh, who's... I mean, presumably you, you want to ask, uh, well, if this isn't in your interest to know, why did we write this book? <laughs> What's the point of telling people things that it's not in their interest to know here? Aren't you better putting the book away and, and pretending it doesn't exist? Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, so from the point of view of just you know natural interactions and, and being the sort of person evolution made you to be so that other people will like you in the way they usually do, we are doing you a disservice by writing this book and having me read it. Of course, we're not going to make you read it. We, we will hope that the people who choose to read it are the ones who are more interested in it. I often think that, um, say, 20-year-olds, when they're first starting to understand the world, uh, they might say, uh, you know, I'm just getting a lot of bullshit from all sorts of people here. Won't anybody just tell me what's really going on? And uh, for such a person, you might want there to be at least one book in the world that says, okay, you sure you really want to know? Then here it is. And, you know, beyond that, I would say social scientists and economists in particular, uh, we need to really have a, a, an accurate idea of what the key motives and behaviors are if we're going to study those areas and make reasonable policy recommendations. The problem is that uh, because we each say we go to say go to school to learn the material, uh, most policy analysis of something like school is based on that usual story of learning the material. So people work out better ways to encourage learning the material and, and better incentives and better structures. And they do studies on that and they publish them. And then what they find is people are remarkably uninterested in their solutions. People don't really want <laughs> school processes that help them learn the material better, faster. That's not the priority. Uh, and that frustrates and puzzles social scientists who think, but, you know, look, we just solved your problems. Why, why don't you care? And then we complain that people don't understand our social science or that they're ignorant or that they're selfish or they're, they're confused because otherwise, surely they would be listening to our suggestions. Um, but once you understand that you could have been just wrong right from the get-go about what the point of it was, then you might realize that if you want to offer useful suggestions for reform that might actually get adopted, that instead of designing a, a, a reform that will give people more of the thing they say they want, you should instead be trying to design a reform that will let people continue to appear to be trying to get the thing they say they want while actually getting more of the things they really want more of, which is harder. It's a harder design problem. <laughs> But it's the problem we should work on if we're actually going to make useful reforms that will actually get adopted. Right. So to the 20 year old person who maybe, you know, notices all the duplicity in everyday life, I think a lot of, um, you know, nerdy people sort of get frustrated with this. They, they see that a lot of people are doing things for other than their stated reasons. And there, there's a temptation to stand up and say, you know, the emperor has no clothes. But then part of what I think you're saying in this book is, you know, if, if you stand up and say the emperor has no clothes, someone will take you aside and say, OK, look, we we know the emperor has no clothes, but pretending it serves these valuable purposes. It holds our society together. There's all these good reasons that you should be pretending it to. Uh, right. And, and sometimes the young person thinks, well, you're just making up an excuse. <laughs> Right. You just think you will suffer if you go along with me and say the emperor has no clothes. Uh, surely we'd all be better off if we would admit to this. Uh, the, you know, and that does seem to make sense from the young person's point of view. So just picking on these one at a time uh, doesn't work so well. So that was the whole point for having a book for having 10 areas all in one book. There are entire books on each of these areas. And say our education chapter is drawn from my colleague Brian Kaplan's new book, The Case Against Education, which I recommend. But when you only read one area, say the book on education, you're tempted to uh, think, well, look, this, you're, you're offering a pretty weird explanation here. <laughs> Even if you've offered a lot of evidence for it, I mean, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and you just haven't met that standard. So I'm going to figure that there must be something else that you know really explains this and, and makes the usual story work. And if you're saying recommending to someone that they should go along with this usual story, well, may, that might sound like uh, you just don't want to rock the boat. <laughs> you don't want to you know, cause trouble and uh, you don't want them to cause trouble for you. And, and you're just being a coward. So I think it's when you see a lot of different areas all at once and you see it's not just in a few areas that we're uh, wrong about our motives, we're wrong all over our lives. Now you might find the claim that any one area is motives are wrong or mistaken is, is more plausible. 
and you might less accuse somebody of um, just trying to hide their hypocrisy in one area and more see that, hey, there's this whole overall pl- pattern where all of us all over the place are just wrong about what we do. Right. So you mentioned at the start of the conversation that uh, you started to catch on to these ideas while learning about medicine and the medical system. I think we should uh, probably return to that because um, maybe some listeners are thinking, "Hey, what 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 is wrong with the medical system, or, or isn't isn't medicine about health? How how could you possibly know, or or uh, what possible evidence could show that medicine is not about health? So where where does that evidence come from? So medicine is probably one of the areas that people are the least aware. Now, how aware people are of their motives does vary a lot from place to place here, and, and from topic area to topic area. And person to person, we we actually are quite aware. So uh, we start with the example, a child skins their knee and then the parent comes over to the crying child and kisses the boo-boo and the child stops crying. Now, everybody knows this is not medically helpful, uh, at least not much, but still it's appreciated. The parent is showing they care and the child appreciates that you show the care. We we also know that if someone's sick in the hospital, uh, the thing you're supposed to do is to go visit them there to reassure them that uh, people care about them and they aren't forgotten. And, uh, you know, take even a card from the office that other people signed to show that the rest of the people at the office are concerned. Somebody is sick nearby who lives near you, you might take them a meal over to to help them out. These are all things that we know to do uh, related to health and, and sickness. And we're quite aware that these are things mostly being done, you know, to show concern. But we also tend to think that, you know, when we're talking about going to the doctor and the guy in the white coat and giving you drugs and surgery and all those other things, well, that's all about making you better. Uh, We we just tend to presume that medicine is largely about making you better. And the only way in any of these areas I'm going to convince you otherwise is to start to show you a bunch of specific puzzles that just don't make sense from the point of view of the usual story. So to start out in medicine, the big punch right in the right in the gut, uh, be ready. Uh, There's very little correlation between health and medicine. When we look at geographic areas that spend more on medicine or where people go to the doctor more often, uh, those areas do not have people who live longer or who die less. Um, That's a very consistent result. In addition, we have randomized experiments where sometimes we have given some people randomly higher prices for medicine or lower prices for medicine. And we've seen the people who have the lower prices for medicine consume more medicine. Uh, They take advantage of this low price and they get a lot more. And when they get a lot more, they are not healthier. They are, of course, any experimental result is within some accuracy. So within some accuracy range, we see no effect on health. Uh, That's one puzzle. Now you might say, well, okay, maybe it's a really small effect and you can't see it in your experiments, but health is so important that surely even a very small effect is worth uh, spending a month. But we spend 18% of GDP in the US on medicine, and we actually know of a bunch of other things that affect health apparently through much larger magnitudes that we're not very interested in. We have exercise and smoking and air quality and social status and religion and social connections and sleep. All of these things have much larger correlations with health, and plausibly some of that's causal, uh, than does medicine. Yet it's very hard to get anybody interested in talking about, you know, increasing those things and having policies for them and having government, you know, subsidies or whatever. But as soon as you talk about medicine, everybody's emotionally there. So those are two puzzles so far, and I've got more. You want to hear more? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Okay, going further, uh, people are remarkably disinterested in private signals about the quality of medicine. So uh, there's a study where people living in a particular area near certain hospitals uh, were about to undergo heart surgery where the risk of death was a few percent. And there was data available to them uh, about which hospitals and which doctors had what death rates. And they varied quite a lot. And these people were asked, how much would you be willing to pay for this information, which might plausibly reduce your chance of dying by a percent or more. And only 8% were willing to pay $50. And uh, those who were actually given the information, it basically didn't influence their choices. So people just, they don't want to go there in terms of thinking about which doctors or hospitals or procedures are more effective. They, they just don't like to think about that. They'd rather just trust their doctor or trust somebody else to make that decision for them even when the consequences are pretty large for them. We also know that medicine is something where as you get rich in any one society, you spend a smaller percentage of your income on medicine. But as your society gets richer, 
overall, you spend a larger fraction of income on medicine. So with respect to a society, it's a luxury, but with respect to an individual, it's a necessity. So the fact that other people around you spend more on medicine makes you spend more on medicine. Uh, there's some sort of keeping up with the Joneses effect. Medical historians say that through most of history, doctors on average hurt people. They you know, touched some sick people and went over and touched other sick people and spread disease. And we have seen medical textbooks from 2000 BC, which describe a system of medicine much like the medicine that we see here today, even though most of the things in their textbook that they learned to do were not very effective according to modern medicine. Nevertheless, they were experts. They went through a training. They learned specific things to do for specific conditions, and each specific thing to do tended to require expensive, rare ingredients that were processed in a complicated way. They also, of course, went along and said some certain words with it in order to make it work, but we don't tend to do that today. <laughs> and so there's this puzzle. Why does on the surface medicine from so long ago look so much like our medicine today when supposedly their medicine didn't work and ours does? Right. So the real puzzle there is why are we getting all this medicine? What is the, the hidden motive? What what deep down is the reason why we, uh, we go through this whole uh, ritual of buying medicine? Right. So the analogy uh, that I'll call your attention to is with giving somebody chocolates on Valentine's. Now, the thing you're giving them, chocolates, has some nutritional value, some calories at least. And the, uh, the simple explanation for that is that uh, they need calories and you're helping them out by giving them calories. That simple theory, of course, has some problems. <laughs> So one problem is that when you decide how much chocolate to give them, you don't ask yourself how hungry they are. Instead, you ask yourself, how much do I need to give so that they won't think of me as someone who doesn't care very much? I have to distinguish myself from someone who would care less and give less, and I have to wonder how much they would give, and then I need to give more. Uh, in addition, when I'm giving you a box of chocolates as a gift and the quality is relevant, I care mainly about public signals of quality, but not private signals of quality. That is, if I happen to know that a certain brand of chocolate that most people think is good is not really very good, I might still give it because I still might think I would get credit for it because it's the thing you're supposed to give. And similarly, you might, as a recipient of the gift, you might privately think that that's not such a great brand of chocolate either. But still, if you don't think I know that, you might still give me credit for my generous gift because I gave the, the thing you're supposed to give, the thing that people tend to think is high quality. So uh, moving over to medicine, if we say medicine is like kissing the boo-boo, showing that you care, then we might give too much medicine so that on the, on the margin, the extra medicine we get more or less of isn't very helpful because we're trying to show that we care and we have to do more of that and that we, we can't afford to show that we care more as we get richer, which is why medicine is a luxury and why we it matters how much other people are giving because we're being compared to other people and asked who cares more. And because it's a gift, we only care about public signals of quality and that's why we're disinterested in these private signals about the quality of medis medical personnel and procedures. So it's not that you give medicine to someone else. It's that you get medicine for yourself to let your loved ones know that you care about being around for them. You know, if you're... Well, so actually today, most medicine is given. <laughs> so families buy medicine for their, you know, the head of the, the bread earner supposedly in a family buys medicine for their family. They get their family a health insurance program. Employers uh, give it to to employees, um, you know, nations give it to citizens. It is mostly given instead of taken. And if you think about, uh, say, Valentine's chocolate, imagine that on Valentine's, you didn't have someone to give you chocolate. Might you buy yourself some chocolate and leave it around the office? It would not serve the same purpose. Well, it still might make you not seem to be the sort of person who nobody cares about. Ah, uh, okay. You might feel bad that you don't have someone to give you Valentine's chocolate, and you don't want people to know that and, and be sorry for you. You don't want people to feel sorry for you, because that makes you look bad. So you might buy yourself chocolate just to look like everybody else does. You, you look like a person that other people care about. And you feel that way, too. This is the idea of comfort food or other comfort procedures. Once, once there's this association, say, with a certain kind of food, and that's what mom used to make, and that's what families eat together. Even if you're away from the family and mom, you might want to order that food because that makes you feel comfortable. So medicine is usually a gift then, and people buy medicine for others. People... Uh, or states. Um, of course, in, in politics, medicine is really, really important. 
you know, all, all, there are always debates about how medicine is going to be provided and how much and how much they're going to spend. And it would seem to fit that, um, you know, what one would think uh, that we would reach the same solution to providing people with medicine that we do to providing people with, you know, groceries, uh, since you know, both are required to live, you know, they're a little different because there's the risk element. And so, you know, you know, people in general are going to need insurance, but it, it really does seem like medicine is treated different politically. And I know you have a chapter on politics, so maybe we can segue into that. It's treated really different than other things. And so it kind of fits with uh, medicine as something other than just a good that makes you live longer. Medicine is a socially important signal of something, of caring, of uh, being taken care of by your by government or by loved ones. That's the first thing that stands out when you start to study medicine is it's different somehow. And the big question is what? Now, we, we should notice that we do a lot of things to show that we care about each other. We, we talked about just, you know, stopping by and chatting on at the when you get to work, etc. And so you might ask, well, why is this thing we do to show that we care so much different than all the other things we show that we care about people? I mean, I might show that I care about you, that noticing you got a haircut and saying it looks nice, right? Or inviting you over for dinner. So one big thing that's different about medicine is that it's an infrequent large expense. So if you think about our distant ancestors, you know, they also would stop by and chat with each other as a way to show that they had interest in each other. But if you were thinking of betraying someone, you might stop by and chat with them every day up until the moment you betray them. So it's a signal of allegiance and, and, and loyalty, but a relatively short-term signal. But if there's something you need to do for them that's rare and really expensive, then um, if you were about to betray them, um, just the next time you're supposed to do that would be the perfect time to not do it. And medicine, health is like that. So your distant ancestors, when they had an injury or sickness, they needed to uh, be taken care of for perhaps a few weeks while they you know, sat and rested and uh, recovered. They need to be fed and protected from predators and kept warm, etc. Perhaps carried back to camp when they were injured. This is a fair bit of work. But if you expect to be an ally with someone for a long time, it could be worth the work to, to put this investment into your friend who will then recover and then be your friend. But if you were on the margin about whether you wanted to stick with them as an associate, uh, the moment they got injured is the perfect time to dump them because uh, you don't want to make this long-term investment. You didn't expect it to be that valuable. And so the fact that you do make the investment tells other people that you are actually in it for the long run with them. It's not a short-term sort of alliance. It only makes sense to make this big, chunky, rare investment in them if you expect to stay with them for a while. Huh. Right. In order to recoup that investment, you it needs to be a long-term one. Which is why it's a very potent emotionally symbol of loyalty. They show up at the hospital or whatever and, and they say they care and then you say, you know, gosh, you really are planning to stick with me. So to move on to the chapter about politics, it seems like, you know, this me medicine, this signal of, of caring and of loyalty has translated into, you know, a huge part of politics where we, you know, we signal, we signal our loyalty to our whole society by supporting a particular system of medicine or a way of delivering, paying for medicine for the whole population. How does that fit into your explanation of politics? I think listeners, having listened this far, will will uh, realize that you're, you're not going to just see politics as a way to cast one vote and decide on the optimal institutions. Sure. So first we have to ask, if we were to ask people, why are you involved in politics? Why are you voting? What, what, what's the point? Uh, there's a usual story. And that usual story is to make better policy. If you talk about politics and, and tell people what you think better policies are, then they might influence them. And then when you vote, you might choose the politicians who will more likely to adopt those better policy. And then... Uh, you are going to influence policy by, you know, talking with people about it and choosing who you vote for, or even running for office yourself. That would be the simple, straightforward story that you might give. And as usual, there's a bunch of problems with that story, a bunch of things that don't make that much sense. So we, we do care enormously about who we talk to or marry or, or work with in terms of their political affiliation. It's not just uh, affecting policy, but we seem to very much prefer to be around people who share our political views. 
Um, when we um, vote, even, and, and who we vote for, it's, it tends to be more group interest than personal interest. Um, we don't tend to look very much at how pivotal an election is when we decide whether we vote there. Some elections, uh, there's very little chance of influencing them, and others, there's much larger chance and that difference doesn't make much uh, of a difference to whether we vote. We personally tend to care more about just saying what our favorite positions are uh, rather than you know thinking about how we might compromise them to get an actual outcome where we're less focused on outcomes. And that's also true for the politicians we pick. We like politicians who agree with our positions and take those positions. And we don't actually care very much whether the politicians are good at doing politics in terms of making deals and, and make getting bills passed and all that sort of thing. We tend to even like to go out of our way to sacrifice in politics. And um, we, we, again, will avoid compromise. We, we just don't like to talk about how we want to compromise. And famously, a lot of uh, political positions tend to align on a one-dimensional spectrum, which is remarkable given how high-dimensional the real policy space is. There's an enormous set of possible policies, but still we all line up on this one left-right spectrum. So the question, as usual, is how can we make sense of all of these puzzles from that the usual story doesn't work for? And our alternative theory here is instead of people in politics being Dudley do-rights who, who do the right thing, trying to make better policy, they are what we might call apparatchiks, which is a word from the Soviet Union, a very loyal political um, wonk. And that means we're, we're trying to show our loyalty to people around us. So there's a famous example uh, from the Soviet Union where there was a speech given and Stalin was praised at one point and he wasn't even in the room, but everybody stood up and clapped loudly because you all wanted to show your support for Stalin. And people kept clapping and they kept clapping <laughs> and it went on for eight minutes. And during that eight minutes, individuals said to themselves, well, I don't want to be the first one to stop clapping because then other people will think I don't like Stalin as much as other people. And then maybe that'll go badly. And so they kept clapping. And finally, one person did stop clapping and sat down first. And then whew, everybody else could sit down. And then that person was taken off to Siberia that night <laughs> because that was interpreted as a symbol of their uh, disloyalty. Uh, and show, So that's a pretty extreme example. Uh, politics in our world isn't that extreme, although it's been getting worse over the last few decades. But we are more trying to show our loyalty because, as I said, you actually have very little chance of influencing an election by voting, but you do have an enormous chance of influencing what the people around you think of you. And the people around you really do prefer that you share their politics. Right. I've noticed uh, in, in a lot of political circles, regardless of ideology, there's a tendency for people to, you know, once they join a group, you know, say they, they become a, a libertarian, you know, they because they, they notice that, that the DMV doesn't work so well and, you know, a couple other things. If they join a community of libertarians, usually what will happen is within six months, they'll be a, a hardcore anarchist. And some people interpret that as, well, you know, these ideas are anarchist ideas are so obviously correct. So as soon as you're exposed to them, you're naturally going to adopt them. But, you know, you, we notice that people who believe in equality and then join a, a left wing group, you know, in six months, if, if they're built their community about that, they'd be a hardcore communist. So and that seems to happen where people get more extreme. And I, I think this really fits with the idea of your political views and opinions and expressed um, beliefs being a way of signaling your commitment to the people around you. And it, it makes a lot of sense that by adopting the most, if you have a community built around one particular belief, then to express that you are extremely committed to that community, you could hold the most extreme version of that belief. And that would uh, that would say to everyone else, like, you know, hey, I, I'm not leaving anytime soon. I'm, I'm really committed to this community, this movement, my friends, the people around me. So it, it like something I've, I've noticed and it really fits with your, your explanation of politics and not so much with pure, rational, just wanting the best institutions explanations. In terms of what's the most reasonable belief, usually some sort of middle ground is, tends to be reasonable. If you ask people, how long after the mention of the Stalin's name should people clap? <laughs> They might say five or ten seconds or something. That might be what they would say is the most reasonable belief. But there's an asymmetry in uh, how people treat you going in the different directions from that most reasonable belief. You know, if there's a typical degree of which you should suspect the DMV of being inefficient based on the evidence, then um, if you are more anti-DMV, uh, then people might think you're wrong, but they still think you're loyal. <laughs> 
But if people think, if you think the DMV is better than other people think, well, you're just as wrong, but now you're more suspected of not being one of us. Maybe you're just a wolf in sheep's clothing. Maybe you really have sympathies elsewhere and you're just being here because this is a convenient job or club or whatever else. And so when you're trying to show loyalty, um, extremity is a tolerated and even uh, preferred relative to a moderate position that risks being too moderate. So we're running low on time. Your book concludes with some uh, some helpful advice. You know, what, what do you think listeners or potentially readers when, when your book comes out? Uh, I'll have a link to it at the show notes page at economicsdetective.com. Uh, what, what conclusion w- would you say someone should draw from all this? What's the, the main helpful takeaway? Well, if you are a policy person, then the recommendation should be, you know, you really need to get on this and understand this if you're going to make sense of policy and, and make reasonable recommendations. Then I think there are other sorts of takeaways you might have that we might want to discourage you from taking away. <laughs> so one thing to be clear about is uh, when we talk about signaling and showing things, the things you're showing are things you really have. It's not like they're fake showed. <laughs> so, you know, I talked to recently someone in the military. And then when I was talking about the book, they thought, well, does this mean that courage isn't real? Or just people are faking courage. Well, and if you say that soldiers try to show each other that they are strong and courageous, um, that it is does help you understand soldiers' behavior beyond their just being strong and courageous. I do think they are trying to show that. But that doesn't mean they don't successfully show it and that they aren't actually that. That is, when you signal things, you are showing things that you actually have. And so you successfully show it. Through school, you might actually show that you are smart and conscientious and conformist. In medicine, you can show that you actually care about people that you really do care about. And so this isn't about saying that these things are unreal or fake. They are real things you're showing. And, you know, also that, uh, you know, in some ways people are less idealistic or meet their ideals less than they might claim or suggest, but they're still great people. (laughs) You know, we're, we're still enormous fans of humanity. And even if humanity isn't the angels they pretend to be, they're still great creatures to be around and to know and to love. And this isn't any particular reason for being down or depressed or uh, snide or, or grumpy or complainy. That's not what we're trying to do here at all. We're trying to just figure out what's really going on. And, you know, it's worth noticing that even though we aren't the angels we pretend, we have done remarkable things, even in terms of being good to each other in cooperation. We are by far the most cooperative species on the planet. (laughs) And through our cooperation, we have done absolutely remarkable things and will continue to do even more. And that's because whatever else we are, we do cooperate we do show our loyalty. We do figure out how to work together and we do achieve remarkable things. My guest today has been Robin Hanson. Robin, thanks for being part of Economic. Economics Detective Radio. Thanks for having me. If you enjoyed my conversation with Robin Hansen, how about come discuss it in my private Facebook group? That's Economics Detective on Facebook. You just need to search the words Economics Detective and request to join the group. If this is your first time hearing the show, I encourage you to subscribe through your favorite podcast app. That way you can have every episode delivered conveniently to your phone so you can become a regular listener. I guarantee other episodes are every bit as good as this one. So subscribe to Economics Detective Radio in your favorite podcast app, and I'll be back next week.